if I had to pick, uh, from a technical viewpoint, uh, the most difficult one uh, that you're likely to uh, um, come across in these series of presentations, it will be it will be this one. It's a relatively long one, um, but nevertheless, it is probably the most important one uh, with respect to whether it's geometallurgical modelling or whether you're modelling for design purposes, greenfield or brownfield um, design. Power-based modelling. What is power-based modelling? In very broad terms, power-based modelling um, has a number of steps. The key is kilowatt hours per tonne in that power-based modelling desires to generate that number of a particular comminution machine. In a design project, for example, you might be um, given a specific throughput and that usually is dictated by some financial uh, decision that's been made by the higher ups in the organisation that says this comminution circuit needs X tonnes per hour. And if we know kilowatt hours per tonne, which is associated with the machine and obviously the hardness of the rock, and we multiply tonnes per hour by kilowatt hours per tonne, we end up with a power kilowatts. Our next step then is to choose a machine that's able to generate that power with some contingencies thrown in. If we're looking at milling, ag milling, sag milling and ball milling, then once we've found this number, we now need to choose a machine big enough to draw that power. And for that, we need a separate type of equation. We need a power equation. Now, a lot of people get confused about kilowatt hours per tonne and kilowatts and power based and power modelling. A power model in this context, and we're going to look at it in a later presentation, is a model that relates the geometry of the machine, the load inside the machine, to the amount of power that it draws. That's a separate type of equation. What we are going to talk about now is the equation that predicts the specific energy, because that's related principally to the hardness of the rock. And so we're following on from that all characterization presentations earlier. You will also see and maybe hear people talk about energy size relationships. And typically power based equations are manifestations of some form of energy size relationship. And we're going to start by looking at some theoretical relationships and maybe you may have seen some of these before. If you look at the literature, go back to 1937, Walker, I think there were two other guys he was working with, came up with this general equation for energy size reduction. E is the energy, specific energy. And it's a differential equation. It says a change in energy is related to C, which is a constant, which he said is a hardness value of some description, divided by some size parameter, X, and we use P80. Don't ask me why we use 80% passing size. I've yet to find out why, but we seem to have stuck with 80% passing size. That's what this industry uses, and it's raised to N. And N corresponds to the order of the process. If we integrate that, we then set N, the exponent, to 2. You end up with von Rittinger's equation. That goes back to 19, 1867. And what that equation looks like is that specific energy is the hardness and you can see here it's the inverse of the P80 minus the inverse of the F80. 
If you put n equal to 1 and you integrate that term, you end up with this guy, Kick, 1885. He said, no, energy size, that's the right form of the equation. Bond, and I hope most of you have heard of Bond, Fred Bond, he said, no, n is not 2, n is not 1, I'm going to go for something right in the middle, I'm going to go for 1.5. And when I integrate that term, we get Bond's famous 0.5 there. Charles and Holmes, they're two different researchers. Simultaneously, they came to the conclusion or they suggested that that n was actually not a constant. It's not 1. It's not 1.5. It's not 2. It, it, it's variable. It doesn't, it's not always the same. And so their equation, suggested equation, looks something like this. Obviously, n is in that differential equation. You integrate it, and then you get a number, m in this case. And they said it depended on the stress conditions of that breakage event and the material type. Hooky, or hucky, I'm not... 100% certain how to pronounce his name, is a Scandinavian man. And in 1961, he said, yes, he agrees with Walker, uh, with Charles and Holmes, that N is not constant, it varies. But he went further. He said it varies systematically as the particle size varies. He then went one further, and he said it, it also varied in a very, very predictable manner, and that at coarse sizes, when rocks are really big, it actually obeyed Kick's relationship. And at fine sizes, it obeyed von Rittinger's. And surprise, surprise, Bond in the middle, it obeyed Bond. So he was trying to make everybody happy. In 2004, I published a paper, and my conclusion was that Walker's equation was wrong. It's too simple. My view of the world, certainly and still is, that there are two things going on. Hardness is not a constant with respect to size. Hardness varies with size. On top of that, you have the process of size reduction. And yes, there is some exponent to the size reduction, but there are two functions. So here, there is a function associated with the variability of hardness, and there's a function associated with the size reduction. The problem is that actually is a useless equation because you can't integrate it. And the reason you can't integrate it is that my belief anyway is these functions aren't constant. They'll vary for other reasons as well. And even if I could find a constant function, I suspect the equation would be too complex for integration anyway. Conclusion is, yes, isn't this interesting, but we really need a pragmatic approach. We need something for practicing metallurgists. It's no good having a theoretical equation uh, for a practicing engineer because you need answers. So my pragmatic approach was, I think Hucky was correct. There is some association of that exponent here and here with size, but what the relationship to size is, I don't know. I don't believe it's hooky, uh, uh, sorry, I don't believe it's bond in the middle, kick at one end and von Rittinger on the other. That function is whatever the data says it is. Problem is, how do we find out what that function is? Again, if I criticize myself, it's all very well and good for me to say, yes, it varies with, with size, but we need to find it. And back in 2000, I started to have a look to see what the data actually said that function should be. Now, before I get into that particular part, and this now to some extent is a story, and it's a story of how I came to get to uh, that Morel equation, as it is now called. Back in the year 2000, I started to work for myself as a consultant. And 
um, as a consultant, one's asked to size equipment and design circuits. And I wanted to have my own power-based equation so that for my clients, I could say, yes, your sag mill should be this big or this big or this big. And to do that, I needed equation to predict kilowatt hours per ton. That, I wanted my own power-based equation so that I could be confident that I was doing the right thing by my client. In those days, if you read the literature, you will see FSAG term. It keeps on coming up and it keeps on coming up and it keeps on coming up. And in the literature, that FSAG was described as um, a factor that you had to apply to equations like bond to account for the fact that ag and sag mills were not efficient machines. Because the conclusion in those days were, if ball milling is here in terms of efficiency, ag and sag milling is down here. They are less efficient. And this F sag value, if it was much bigger than one, it meant that in this particular case, the sag mill was really inefficient. If you could get an F sag down to one, it means it was efficient as ball milling. So I thought if I could find some pattern between F sag and something, maybe it was the type of circuit, maybe it was the ore type, anything. I was looking for anything I could find that I could generate an equation. What did I do? Look at data. And at that time, I had something like 27 different circuits that at that point in my life, I had surveyed those circuits and I had collected data to do with the sag mill circuit and the ball mill circuit. These were SAB, SABC circuits. And I took the throughput and power draw and the feed sizes and the product sizes and I worked out the bond operating work index. Now, for those of you who are not quite certain what the bond operating work index, there's the equation there. You take the bond equation, W there is that true kilowatt hours per ton of the circuit. That's the true P80 and that's the true F80. So I collected all these from surveys of all these circuits. And then when you put it into that equation, this bond work index, the operating work index, is sort of a measure of the efficiency of the circuit. And I calculated it for the sag mill circuit, that what these blue dots are, and I calculated it for the ball mill circuits. Now, I've joined all these dots here. It's not meant to indicate any trend. It's just made, it's meant to make it look easy for you to see these are all the sag mills all joined up because each one of these are different mines, different parts of the world. And here's all the ball mill operating work indices joined up. So they should be different from one another. But what I want to show you is that you can see in this circuit, look how high the operating work index is for the sag mill, 45 kilowatt hours per tonne compared to the ball mill. So that is what the uh, researchers and the engineers of the day would call the FSAG. So I thought I'm onto something here because in some cases FSAG is small. So I started to look at each of these operations to see if I could find a pattern. And at the same time, I got together a lot of pilot data because in my working life, I've been involved in a lot of pilot tests and I had a lot of pilot data. Now, don't ask me why I plotted the data like this, but I did. And what this data is, is the operating work index of all these pilot sag mills that I had. I think there's something like 60 or 70 data sets. The different colors are associated with uh, different pilot mills, different parts of the world. Some are from Chile, some were from Lakefield in Canada, some were from Australia, some were from South Africa. So I plotted them all up and I plotted them against particle size. And I was shocked to see there looks to be some sort of trend there, but I could not understand why should there be a trend like that? Different ore types, it, I just didn't understand it. Spent some time thinking about it and the conclusions I came to were that possibly three. Just remember that's bond operating work index and it is a measure of the efficiency of that circuit. The lower the bond operating work index, more efficient. That's what it's meant to be. So this line says 
that that value on average reduces as the particle size reduces. Does that mean then that ore is easier to grind as it gets finer? Well, I didn't think that was a very sensible conclusion to make because generally it gets more difficult to grind as it gets finer. So, no, that can't be. Could it be that mills get more efficient as they, get, uh, um, as they grind finer? Well, I didn't think that was a very sensible conclusion either because I've been involved a lot in fine grinding, ultra fine grinding, and I can assure you that those mills are not very efficient. So that wasn't very sensible either. Now, I was brought up as an undergraduate and even later as, as basically being told, you know, bond is a law, right? It, that's it. You don't question bond at all. But I was forced to actually consider that actually in this particular case, the reason for this may be it's the bond equation itself that's wrong and it's causing that particular interesting shape. So I remembered reading Hooky. You remember what I was saying about Hooky? Hooky's, Hooky's reasoning. And Hooky published a paper. Here's the name of it. It's a really lovely name. Proposal for a Solomonic Settlement Between the Theories of Von Rittinger, Kick and Bond. He wanted to keep everybody happy. If uh, you know your Old Testament, Solomon was a wise king. So Solomonic means a wise uh, settlement between those theories. This is a photocopy, uh, effectively, of the paper. The quality of the paper I have was not very good, so it's, it's not that clear. Um, I'm going to take some of the data out of it and show you a bit more clearly afterwards. But increasingly, I'm seeing other researchers reproduce this paper and they seem to have taken on board already that what Hookie says must be true. And what Hookie put in this graph are a series of data points. What it's showing us is the size of particle at the bottom here from what we've got here, 10 meters. So he goes up to massive, massive rocks down to down here microns. And he plotted this graph here, or he created this graph. And if you remember that equation of Walker, if you integrate Walker's equation, you get a relationship for kick. And kick would say that dotted line is true. And Hookie said, look, my curve line there meets kick's dotted line. At the other end, that's von Rittinger's line there. And Hookie said, look, my curve follows von Rittinger. And the same for Bond. There is Bond down there. So there it is. There's the settlement. Well, Hookie was a little bit naughty. Because he gave in his paper four data points for his graph, which are these four there. Now, to give him his due in his paper, and I quote, he said the data was imaginary. So his graph, basically, was an imaginary graph as well. But a lot of people have now taken it to be a true graph. These are his four data points. And then he, he extrapolates and he makes that go further that way and he makes that go further that way. But to make it clearer, that's basically what Hookie said. There's our von Richinger line, there's our bond line, and there's our kick line. His imaginary data are as follows. And what he did, he divided up comminution into four size fractions. A hundred millimetres down, sorry, I beg your pardon, a thousand millimetres, one metre, down to a hundred millimetres is primary crushing. And he said primary crushing takes 0.35 kilowatt hours per tonne. Then we go to secondary crushing. That goes from a hundred millimetres down to 10 that takes 0.6. Coarse grinding, he called between 10 millimetres and 1, 1 1.6. And finally, he said fine grinding, 1 millimetre down to 0.1 millimetres. So there are his four data points. I've collected a huge amount of data over my working life, so I decided to separate out all the crushing and grinding stuff 
and tried to correct for all the hardnesses and come up with my own numbers that the data said were real as opposed to imaginary. And that's the line I get, and it does not follow Hookie at all. If you look at the numbers that my data, real data says, primary crushing point two, he says secondary crushing from 100 millimetres down to 10 millimetres. If you're into crushing, that is not secondary, that's secondary and tertiary. That is a big size reduction. The general rule for crushing stages is factors of three. So feed to product, factor of three. So to get from 100 down to 10, you've got to do that in two steps, three and three, that's secondary and tertiary. So all my data suggested nearer 1.7. Coarse grinding, I mean 1.6 to me is ridiculous, and nearer 4.9, and yes, fine grinding, I'm, I'm happy with that. So that is more the shape, real data, not imaginary. And if you look at the gradients of those lines, it's not zero down at this end, it's actually minus 0.1 for down here. And at that end, it's minus 0.3. Yes, bond is somewhere in the middle of it, but this is not following anything like what Hookie said it should be. What happens with what we now call ultrafine grinding? say where uh, tower mills and verti mills are down in here. Well, I've not put any data points up here, but just to give you some idea of maybe where that line would subsequently go with machines like verti mills, is that if you look at Alex Yankovic's PhD thesis, Alex was a PhD student of mine. We did a lot of uh, fine grinding work in the late 1990s using stirred mills and this comes straight out of his PhD thesis. This is a stirred mill grinding quartz with an eight millimeter ball. This is a stirred mill grinding quartz with a two millimeter ball. So this is size versus kilowatt hours per ton and the gradient of that line is the equivalent to what we're looking at here. I just wanted to see, I wonder what the gradient would be up here. If you look at these two equations that were fitted to that data, the gradient is that exponent, minus two for that one and minus 1.3 for that one. So there's obviously a great difference between different conditions. Do you remember what Charles and Holmes said? They said that exponent was variable depending on the stress conditions. So Charles and Holmes were probably quite right when it comes to very fine grinding because this exponent is due to an eight millimeter ball and this exponent is due to a two millimeter ball. What this is saying to us is there's no hard rule down at this end. There is not going to be a master line here. It's gonna be this way, that way. It's gonna be all sorts of ways depending on the conditions of the process. So, Hook is Solomonic settlement. No, it's not a settlement. It's not important. I believed and still do that his idea is correct. That that function that we're looking for does vary with particle size. It's not constant as Bond said, or Von Rittinger, or Kick. But we've still, and now we're getting back onto the track and what I was doing almost 20 years ago, I still had to find what this was. Back to my pilot data set, there it is again. If we were to find that function that we want, which varies with particle size, then what that function would do, it would take the problem that Bond's equation gives us, and those blue points there are, for example, those blue points. I'm just concentrating on this because this is one ore type. If this was one ore type and we put bond and we put an operating work index together, which was based on the right exponent, the correct exponents, rather than getting a trend like that with particle size, it should be flat because that means that the, the um, 
C, if you remember Walker's equations, is now constant with size. That's what we're searching for. So I took these data sets and tried to find some sort of function that would convert all these data points to that data, those data points. That's what I ended up with. It's an ugly equation and I wish it could have been a really nice, really sophisticated equation, but it's not. But I tried all sorts of things and at the end of the day, that's the best I could get. That's the shape of it. So its shape looks a bit nicer than the actual equation. And that's the equation you'll see that was published in 2004 and is associated with what is now called the Morel method as opposed to the Bond method. What's interesting is once I had done that, I decided to go back to, because if you remember, initially I was interested in just finding out this FSAG value. I still not got there yet, so I thought, okay, I'll go back and look at my data here and instead of doing a ball mill, I beg your pardon, a bond operating work index, I would now use a Morel operating work index using that function that I just developed. And as you can see, what it does is it makes FSAG disappear entirely. And the conclusion, and that's the conclusion I published, that FSAG is actually not real. FSAG was always an artifact of the fact that the bond equation was wrong. And the reason why, if you go way back to the 1970s and the 1980s, all the papers will tell you, ag and sag mills are not efficient. Bond, ball mills are, ag and sag mills aren't. It's because they were using bonds equation to evaluate efficiency and bond equation was wrong. My conclusion is, and still is, that ag and sag mills from an energy utilization efficiency are no different to ball mills. That doesn't mean that the efficient, if you went out, if you were on a plant now and you measured the efficiency of the ag and the sag mill and compared it to the ball mill, it would be equal. I could take any of your plants and run the ag mill in an atrocious manner and make its efficiency very poor indeed, as I could do with a ball mill. And you will find circuits out there, if you look at them, where their operating work indices are very different. It is not due to their inefficiency of the machine. It's because you're not operating them correctly. But once you've operated them correctly, on average, you will not see any difference between an ag and a sag mill and a ball mill. And if you think about it, what are those machines? They are cylinders which rotate with spherical media inside. Physics is the same in every single one of them. There should be no difference in energy and efficiency, and there isn't. To support that, if you read some of the literature, and this is a really good paper from SAG 2001, Lars Nadal, the Brunswick mine, they were going to convert, and they did convert, their crushing rod mill, ball mill circuit to single stage ag milling. That's about as different as you can get. And they pilot tested every single combination they could think of. Sag ball, ag ball, ag with crushing and ball milling, ag and pebble milling. And they piloted their own circuit. And this is a quote from, from their paper. I'll read it out. Within the accuracy of test results, and that's important. If you remember Matt's presentation about Repeatability and, repeatability and accuracy, there is no significant difference in the total energy requirement for any of these. And he then went on to say that they then installed that circuit, they surveyed that new circuit, and after numerous campaigns, they found they couldn't find any difference in the energy efficiency of their new Agmill circuit to their old circuit. So they certainly supported my conclusions, was there's no difference. Their comparison was not made based on bond or morel. It simply was, what was the real specific energy to go from feed to product? So it wasn't some artifact of a model. All right. <clears throat>
that's enough for theory. So there's all these wonderful theories, which if you're a practicing engineer are of interest to you, but of no real use. We're now going to look at real equations that can be used by engineers to do real work. 2016, an international organization called the Global Mining Guidelines Group decided to recognize two power-based techniques. Um, one was Bonds, based on his work, and I was very proud. I mean, I was nothing to do with this guidelines group. They adopted my technology uh, as well as being uh, world's best practice. So they recommended if you're going to do anything, you should be either looking at Bond or Morel or use both. But these are the two that are currently being uh, recommended by the Global Mining Guidelines Group. So Bond's equation, and I'm sure you've probably seen this before, but Bond developed this equation and it's to be used for sizing crushers, rod mills and ball mills. And these values here come from our laboratory test. They get bolted into here and this equation predicts the specific energy of these machines. My equation in form is not that much different. It's just that rather than minus 0.5, it has that ugly equation I showed in here instead. This value, it's not a bond laboratory work index. Um, when I submitted my paper to an international journal, I had had W there and I was reprimanded by the referee before it was published to say I couldn't possibly use W because that's bond. So, okay, fine, I'll use M then. So that's where the M comes from and it stands for Morel. So there it was and he was happy and I got the paper published. So that's where the M comes from. Um, and so I subsequently kept to the M and the SMC test gives you an MIC, that's for crushing, H, HPGR. It gives you an A for a tumbling mill circuit for coarse grinding, say down to 750 microns. And from the Bond Ball Mill Work Index test, the raw data, I put an equation together, which I'll show you in a minute, to get something called an MIB, which for the secondary grinding or ball mill grinding. So I divided grinding into coarse and fine. Some people, unfortunately, have taken 750 microns in sag mill circuits to be what's called the transfer size. And we're going to talk about transfer size later. Even though I specifically said in my paper, it is not the transfer size, it is still being used by some engineers. It is not, and it should not be used in that way. I just wanted to reiterate that to you, and I'll go on later to explain why. Where did MIB come from? If you have read Bond's papers, and I sincerely hope that you have read Bond's papers, if you look at his laboratory work index test, he developed this equation for taking the raw data, net grams per revolution, that's the closing screen size, that's the P80 and the F80 of the test. If you plug all those numbers in, you get Bond's laboratory work index. My equivalent, the MIB, uses the net grams per revolution, exactly the same numbers, but the equation is slightly different. One thing to remember, whether it's the MIB or Bond's WIB, neither of these are constant with respect to particle size. Even though Bond says they are, they're not. Bond published very little information. But what he did publish was all the data that he used to do his laboratory work index test. On this left hand side, this is from his published paper, P80 versus his laboratory work index. And what he did in his experiments, he took, I think something like 12, 13 different rock types from all over the world. And he did his bond test with different closing screen sizes. He used four different closing screen sizes and he published all of that information. And so I plotted all of that information for all of these different ore types. 
Most people, if you talk to, would say, if it is going to vary with size, what would the Bond Laboratory Work Index do as particle size gets finer? And most people would say it would increase. And there is a very good example for an ore type where you can see Bond's Laboratory Work Index, that orange one, is definitely increasing with particle size. Fine. Look how many actually go in exactly the opposite direction. There's one there. There's another one there. That's counterintuitive. That actually doesn't make sense. To contrast it, the Morel work index, they all go in the direction of increasing with decreasing particle size. Now, the reason that Bond stuff does that is that what he was striving for was to make the Bond laboratory work index constant with particle size. That's really what he wanted to do. And the average of all his data does exactly that. That's the average of all of Bond's published data. That's that blue line. And so he developed his laboratory equation in such a way that on average, that's what he would get. That, however, is the extreme of his data that goes in one direction, and that's the extreme that goes in the other direction. But contrast that with, with the same data, because I reworked all his data with my equations, and the MIB consistently goes up as particle size goes down. Now, it's not a problem with either of them, providing you obey the rule that Bond says, and I'd say it exactly the same. If you are doing a laboratory test because you want to size a circuit, a ball mill circuit, you must make sure that the closing screen of that Bond test generates the same P80 as the circuit. Now, Bond said that very clearly. I'll say it very clearly, but you'll be surprised how many people still don't do that. But if you're in any position to dictate what the closing screen size is of a Bond ball mill work index, please remember that rule because otherwise you can get the wrong answer. All right, what are the limitations of these power-based equations? Well, the first one is that because we're using single point descriptors, P80 and F80 are used to describe an entire distribution. For maths rules to be correct, those distributions must be linear and parallel in log-log space. If they're not, the rules are not obeyed, then you cannot use those power-based equations. If you do, you will get the wrong answer. The other limitation, of course, is, and this is for a green field situation where you've got nothing to measure, you have to dictate or you have to know, predict, what these values will be when that plant is built. So you've got to provide those numbers. By and large, this is a general rule. For closed circuit operations, as in closed with cyclones or very fine screens, those rules are generally obeyed. We'll see some situations where they don't. The other problem, and this is for bond only, bond in his day, ag and sag mills were only just starting. So he never had a chance to develop anything specifically for ag and sag mills. If Bond had lived long enough, I can guarantee that he would develop something and publish something for ag and sag mills. And he would have done the same for HPGRs, but that's higher pressure grinding rolls. But he didn't. Uh, he died before then. And so there is nothing published by Bond that relates to those two machines. In Bond's day, and it's why Bond's equations were developed and worked so well for crushing and ball mills, these were the circuits, crushing ball mill circuits, and this is real data, primary crushing product, tertiary crusher product, ball mill overflow. Those are beautifully linear in log-log space, and that's why his equations don't need to play around with them. They work really well. That is the 80% passing line. If you remember, we, we are obsessed with 80% passing lines. And 
just to refine that rule I told you about how these lines have got to be linear, they have to be linear at least from the 80% passing size downwards. Many curves curve up here. You can see the ball mill, it curves a bit. That's fine, don't worry about that. But from the 80% passing size downwards, has to be straight, must be linear in log-log space. Ag-sag circuits, that is typically the product size that comes out of an ag and a sag mill that's passed down to the ball mill. That does not obey those rules at all. If you look, that's the 80% passing line. That is, the, and we call it a transfer size. And the equation, if you were to use one of those power-based equations and did nothing else, if you could put your place, uh, your, uh, put yourself in the place of the equation, if an equation could think, but play this game with me, the equation would be expecting that line because that line obeys the rules, it will not be expecting that line there. As I said, as a result, those power-based equations, if you use them as they were, would not give you the right answer. So how can we get around it? Well, at least I see it. There's three ways you can get around it. Number one, well, you can just simply ignore it and go on and say, well, it just doesn't exist. You'd be amazed how many people still cling to that. You could avoid it. In other words, you can basically go around it and do something else. Or you could correct for it. Now, it's interesting. And again, I go back to Bond's papers. And again, I strongly recommend you read his papers because there's some great stuff in that. Bond devotes a, quite a chunk of his papers for how you deal with what's called scalped feed to a mill. Um, and that is a distribution which is definitely non-linear. It's not like that transfer size. He recognised that some distributions are not linear and he has, a, he has a method for correcting for that. So have a look and see what he says. So let's have an example of some published equations initially that simply ignore the problem. SPI is an equation that's been published and if you look back at 2001, uh, Dobby et al. Uh, give the equations for the SPI. Kilowatt hours per ton is the SPI, which is a hardness number from the lab test. There's the transfer size raised to the power of five. They simply ignore it and they still use it. This looks like a very, very simple equation, which in this form it is. This is very similar to the form that John Starkey originally developed. John Starkey developed the SPI, sold it to Minovex. Minovex then uh, expanded on it and eventually Minovex sold out to SGS and SGS now own the technology. Dobby et al, very, very good paper in SAG 2001. They give this equation plus all the sub models. There's at least 10 equations that sit behind this because they've got 10 equations to predict this and FSAG and N and K. Now, I don't have a problem with that equation at all because what Minovex did was that once they developed that equation, they collected data and they fitted this equation to that data. So what they actually did was calibrate this out. And that's not a problem. They actually did a sort of correction, but it's buried in all the calibrations. It's very difficult to get to the bottom of it. But at face value, that basically says, no, we're still using the T80. Of course, you still have the problem with this equation if you're using it for design. If you remember, green field, we know nothing. You have to generate that number. And as I said, there's a lot of equations sitting behind that. If you knew those equations, and of course, SGS has those equations, where you can predict that. Who else ignores it? Well, Bond didn't ever publish any equations for using his uh, uh, model for ag and sag mills, but some people have used his technique in this general form. Kilowatt hours per tonne of the sag mill, they said is a combination of crushing work index and 
crushing size reduction, plus some rod milling, plus some bore milling. So they add bits of bits and bits and bits. And uh, if you read, you should be able to get hold of this paper. Barrett and Allen published this equation. As a designer, you need to be able to provide this, 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 because these are the fractions of crushing, rod milling and ball milling that they reckon apply in egg and sag milling. And you have to uh, provide all these intermediate uh, F80s and P80s as well. And that's never been published. So um, I don't know how you would actually use this equation. Some consultants say they do and they have their own um, in-house unpublished uh, um, factors. Uh, but um, that certainly is an example of where the T80 is used and ignored. Back in 2004, my old consultancy company, um, we published this equation where you can see there is no transfer size at all. It basically said that kilowatt hours per tonne of the sag mill is a function of the feed, the hardness, the ball load, the speed, and the aspect ratio of the mill. Basically it says transfer size is irrelevant. It is a symptom of the mill. It's not something that drives anything. It just comes out the back end. Allway Mineral Consultants, they're a well-known consultants, in 2015 published their equation. And when I simplified it down, it actually is exactly the same equation that I published in 2004 except that rather than them using the DWI, they used A times B. But it's exactly the same equation. Can we adjust it? Now, I said to you before, this is my equation. You are not allowed to use my equation like that, hence the cross, because that line does not obey the rules. Can we do something about that? <clears throat> So here is that transfer size distribution. I can assure you that shape, and I've looked at an awful lot of transfer size distribution. In general, that shape holds for just about every single ag and sag mill I've looked at. The shape, in other words, I don't mean it exactly follows that line, but it appears to have what looks like two different parts to it. And it should therefore be as no surprise that you mathematically you can take that and split it into two separate equations, a coarse one and a fine one. These two obey the rules. This is a real example. If you tabulate that equation, so you use Excel, and for each of the size fractions, those are these data points, you tabulate this size distribution and you do the same for this one. You can imagine an Excel spreadsheet, each of one of these in an adjacent column. And you then do a weighting of each of these. 55% of that equation, that line, sorry, plus 45% of that line what you actually end up with is exactly that. So you can decompose these lines into two separate lines that do obey the rules. Here's the ball mill cyclone overflow from that circuit. And you can see they're all beautifully linear. Who cares? So what? Does that get me any nearer what I want to get? Well, yes, it does. Because I've now got two distributions and I've now got two P80s. What am I going to do? I've got two P80s. What I'm looking for is one distribution out of these two, and I want a distribution that obeys the rules. Well, if you look at the heart of the Morel method and the Morel equation, it basically says that the energy is related to the size to the power of that ugly equation. Now, I now have two of these distributions. One is the fine one, one is the coarse one. So I can combine them in this equation here. The fraction of the coarse, coarse F80, 
plus whatever that fraction is, plus the fine F80. So if we use that previous graph as a worked example, and I'll just go back to it quickly, you can see here the coarse one had a P80 of 19 millimetres, 19,000 microns. P80 was, of the fine, was 0.8 millimetres, 800 microns. So there are those two numbers in the Morel equation, 45% of that, 55% of that. I can now solve that equation and that size as a P80 from an energy viewpoint behaves in exactly the same way as that original transfer size. And what I've called that is a virtual transfer size. It's not real, but it behaves itself in terms of power-based equations. So it's a T80, it's virtual, it's got a V, and the M is due to, yes, Morel. And the reason is, if you try and use this in a bond equation, you'll get the wrong answer. It's a Morel virtual transfer size because it uses that ugly form of uh, uh, function that I showed you before. So it's only valid if you use my equation. And that is the distribution. That's the virtual distribution that has the same energy characteristics as that blue line there. And now, if you know that, now you can put it in my equation. There it is, the virtual transfer size. That's all well and good. So now I've told you that providing you know the virtual transfer size as an engineer, you can now use that equation. Well, what is the virtual transfer size? If you're in a green field, how on earth do you get it? You need another equation. And what I found was I've now looked at a huge number of data sets. There is a relationship between that value there, the virtual transfer size, and things like whether you use a pebble crusher, what the aspect ratio is, what the trommel aperture is, what the feed size is, and what the ball load is. All right, just to finish off the power base side of things, what about accuracy? And I said right at the very beginning, and this goes right back to choosing the right test. It's about precision of the test, and it's about the equations that that test use. How accurate are those equations? If those equations are not accurate, then you would be foolish, frankly, to be using them because the results you get will have very, very wide error bars. Let's have a look at Bond's equations. Go back to 1982, and this is Bond's for crushers. A guy called, called Moore published these data. At the bottom is the observed work index. So these are from real plants. And in the y-axis is the laboratory work index. If Bond's test and his equations are correct, these should all fall on that line or at least there should be minimal scatter, but they should be arrayed along that line, and clearly they're not. Now it's interesting, Bond worked for a company called Alice Chalmers, which some of you may have heard. Alice Chalmers was bought up by a company called Svidala. Svidala was bought up by a company called Metso, but Metso's history can be chased back to Alice Chalmers. Alice Chalmers was one of the biggest and most important crusher and mill manufacturers way back and Bond worked for them and shortly after Bond left Alice Chalmers disowned the crushing work index test they basically said this is not a very good test and they developed another one as I said right at the very beginning I cannot believe that people still use the crushing work index test despite everything that's been published about it and these results it basically says you are absolutely wasting your time and wasting your money I've got a lot of crushing data of my own, and so if I update Moore's with my data, it more or less falls bang on Moore's data. There's another lot of, a lot of data. Um, it's really not a good test, and it's not a good equation. Don't use it. The Morel uh, MIC, if you remember, is for crushers. There's the My Crushing database. That goes from pebble crushers up there to primary crushers down there. 
Um, that seems to follow the pattern quite well. You can use the SMC test to get MIH, which is the HPGR equivalent for crushers. If you put it in the Morel equation, you get HPGR, predicted kilowatt hours per tonne versus observed. A lot of my database are laboratory and pilot data. That's the blue points. The purple points are full scale mills. But you can see it's a reasonable correlation. Bond for AG and SAG, as I said, he never developed any equations and I have never ever seen anybody publish any of the equations like Barrett and Allen with any accuracy data at all. So I really have no idea whether those equations work or not. Um, to be the devil's advocate, usually if people don't publish stuff, it means it's because they don't have anything to publish. The SPI, Amelunxen, um did his master's thesis. He was employed by Minovex. This is uh, before Minovex sold to SGS. Really good master's thesis. Well worth looking at his thesis. Very smart guy. Um, he published in 2014 um, this data set uh, where he's predicting what is called the standard circuit. Um, and this is his data and he's and I think he was and I, I know he was unfair in this because this makes the SPI look worse than it is. It's actually not a bad test at all because if you look at this you think well that's that's not good but what it, this says is effectively that F sag is one that's the standard circuit and as the SPI said well no there's a model for F sag and you need to apply that model so that for each of those circuits you can correct and he Amelunxen gives some advice as to what that F, F sag should be. Now he didn't publish that, but I applied his F sags to that data. And you can see it actually does give you much better results as it was meant to when you put that F sag in there. Do bear in mind, however, that these results have been generated using known and measured T80. In a design situation, you would have to predict that, and that would have generated a little bit of scatter. Dobby et al. comment a lot about these three data points, and, and they say at the time they were not certain why these three data points were so off the line, but it needed further research, which is fair enough. Unfortunately, I've never seen any subsequent work that helped explain why whatever happened at this plant, and it was called the Holt McDermott plant, why these were, were, were out so much. It would be really interesting to find out what was the conclusion as to why these were up there. I have heard some people say, and this is not confirmed, that maybe the SPI test is not as good for hard ores. This kilowatt hours per tonne here, if you're a sag mill, and you're drawing 15 kilowatt hours per tonne, that's a seriously hard ore. That is a very, very hard ore. Whether that's the case or not, I simply don't know. The Orway model, this was published in 2015. That's the predicted sag, ag sag mill versus the observed ag and sag mill from Orway's circuit. They have a lot of data. Uh, that, their model seems to work quite well. They give the statistics, that's plus or minus 10%. So it would suggest that most of those data fit within plus or minus 10%. That's quite good. This is the 2004 model, which is similar to the OMC with all my data points for all the different uh, circuits. That seems to work quite well. That virtual transfer size model that I just spoke to, which is going to be up on our website soon, that's the equivalent of that, and that also seems to work quite well as well. If you are into statistics, the 95% confidence interval for this is plus or minus 13%. So that just gives you overall what that accuracy is, but I'll publish that. All right, let's go back to rod and ball mills and the bond equation. Roland. Roland was Bond's disciple way, way back. And after Bond passed away, after Bond got out of the business, 
Roland carried on his work and Roland's published quite a few papers. Roland published a lot of data and so did a guy called Blaskett back in 1969. And that's all their data, observed versus predicted. The ball mill, the blue squares, form Blaskett. The purple squares are from Roland and the triangles are Roland's triangles. So ball mills are the squares. That one you can see is a particularly uh, poor correlation. Um, and the reason for uh, that poor correlation, if any of you know um, a bit about how the Bond equation is used, you will know there are various correction factors. And one of them is called an EF4. It's the coarse feed factor. Um, Bond wrote what that factor is as an equation. And there is a flaw in that equation for coarse product ball mills. That is a very coarse product ball mill. If I remember correctly, it's got a product of about 400 or 500 microns. By modern day standards, that is a really, really coarse product grind. And that EF4 equation goes through the roof with that very coarse. And I don't think Bond intended uh, uh, for that to be. And there is a, a fix you can make with that. If you look at Roland's data, you can see the rod mill stuff, that's, uh, that's going off a bit there. When I put my own data and use Bond, those are those red points. And my red points for ball mills seem to follow exactly Roland. And my triangular points for rod mills seem also to follow Roland. There's a definite, definite bias in Bond's rod mill equation that, that seems to push rod mills off the true line. It's rare to see rod mills nowadays, but anyway, there it is. Bond never intended his ball mill equation to be used for ball mills in ag and sag mill circuits. So this graph is unfair to Bond, but from an academic viewpoint, I used all my ball mill data in ag and sag mills just to see what, did, what would Bond give compared to actual, because I'm just keen to know how near or far it was. And you can see the scatter is in the right direction, at least. There is a lot of scatter, but at least the direction is correct. And the reason for that is the Bond Ball Mill Laboratory Work Index test is still a very, very good test for differentiating hardnesses. And a lot of that trend there has got to do with the fact these are all different hardnesses and Bond's laboratory test, even in his equation, which shouldn't have been used here, does track quite nicely, but there's a lot of scatter there. So one would need to be careful. And just to finish off the power based equation section, um, here's all my rod and ball mill data that I've got um, associated with whether it's an ag mill circuit or a ball mill in a crushing circuit or in an HPGR circuit, or in a rod mill circuit, um, there's using the MIB, if you remember, plus my equation, that all seems to fit fairly well.